much. So uh, as you see, uh, I'm not Christian Degen. Uh, the <laughs> we switched that. So uh, Christian Christian gave the poster and I give the talk. So I'm uh, I'm working with Christian Degen in, in his group, and um, so uh, Christian's group at at ETH has uh, uh, several parts. Oh, sorry. I, uh, now I uh, forgot to thank the organizers, of course. Uh, uh, for this, for bringing us together in this very beautiful place, I especially uh, I'd like to mention that uh, so this is the second nano MRI conference that I uh, have the chance to go to, <coughs> and again I'm, s I'm 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 struck by by the feeling that this is a very nice community where um, people really try to uh, help each other and, and so if you talk to people you you can learn I, I can learn a lot so it's it's really great. <coughs> so uh, okay. Uh, now c consider I started over again, and so Christian's group has three components, and and uh, one of them is magnetic resonance force microscopy, so the detection of small magnetic units or, or nuclear spins with a uh, mechanical detector. And uh, over the last couple of years, there has been a, a number of people who contributed to that part, and I am going to talk about uh, recent work uh, coming out of this part only. So I will not talk about diamond ND magnetometry, which is also going on in our group. <coughs> and I'd like to mention that uh, uh, Mark is here and Martin is here. They're both PhD students in the group. They, they showed posters. And uh, Ye is also here. He used to be a PhD student in the group. He's now a fellow. At, at the Rowland Institute at, at Harvard <coughs> and a lot of the work that you will see uh, is actually also related to him or coming out of his, his work. So what we are trying to do in magnetic resonance force microscopy is, is a miniature version of a, of a clinical MRI. So in a clinical MRI you very basically image the density of nuclear spins in, in a three-dimensional object. Um, I know that this is not s s strictly what, what is done but uh, roughly allow me this simplification and it's uh, detected by in, in inductive electrical signals uh, and and this means that you need a large number of nuclear spins per three-dimensional pixel that's a voxel so typical maybe something like 10 to the 18 nuclear spins and that gives you a resolution of maybe a few micrometers at best and typically more like a, a millimeter and what we want to do is to take a, a MRI of, of nanoscale objects, so objects that are smaller than a single voxel in a, in a clinical MRI. And uh, the, you know, all know this example uh, from uh, uh, Christian Degen, Martino Poggio, and uh, from Dan Ruger's group, where they imaged uh, a single tobacco mosaic virus that's about 300 nanometers long with a resolution of about 10 nanometers. Uh, so you see there's already a a huge uh, improvement in sensitivity, but of course that's not where we are going. Want to be finally, so in the end, we would like to have something like this: uh, a, a 3D spatial image uh, with near atomic or even atomic resolution. At the moment, there is no such no technique that can do such a scan uh, non-invasively and with a single uh, a single object. Uh, so this is uh, purely a, an artistic illustration of how an influenza virus could look like. And we think MRFM could provide such a scan. And, and let me go quickly through uh, uh, how MRFM works, particularly in the type of configuration that we use. So you have your mechanical detector. It's a cantilever in our case, maybe 100 micrometers long, has a, a resonance frequency of 3 to 5 kilohertz. And you have your sample, which might be such an influenza virus. And you put it on the tip of your cantilever. Um, and uh, so, so this, the sample here is schematically just this, this single spin. Now you bring this close to a chip that has a, a little nanomagnet, that's the blue thing, and a strip line. Now the nanomagnet makes a strong magnetic field gradient so that every nuclear spin feels a small magnetic force. And since the spin is part of a sample that is attached to the cantilever, this force is translated to the cantilever. And then we use the strip line to apply NMR pulses, so we can manipulate the nuclear spins, and uh, in particular we can reverse them periodically at, at a frequency that we can uh, to some degree choose, and we choose that frequency to be the resonance frequency of the cantilever. 
And the, uh, by inverting the nuclear spins, we of course also invert the force. So now we have an AC force acting on the cantilever resonantly, and the cantilever starts oscillating a little bit. And that oscillation then we can measure very sensitively with a laser interferometer. Um, so the force per nuclear spin is given just by the, the gradient of the magnetic energy. So uh, you want to increase the gradient of, of your magnetic field uh, source as much as possible. And spatial resolution, I'm not going into this uh, any further during the talk, but spatial resolution is obtained by the fact that spins in different parts of your sample have slightly different Lamo frequencies because they because of the magnetic field gradient and the NMR pulses that we applied are selective with respect to Lamo frequency so you can choose to have signal only from certain slices within your sample and then in addition we also scan spatially with attic tube motors of course <coughs> We tried, we tried Janssen, uh, and I have to second what, uh, what uh, Tiek said. Um, they also have their shortcomings, so they also got stuck. So we, we are fully back with attitude. <coughs> it's true. It's the only thing that, for, for us, it's the only thing that works. So, uh, I mean, this, this sounds very s simple, but, but those who work with in MRFM, Tierk also uh, mention, uh, mentioned it uh, on a side, know that there are lots and lots of small things that can go wrong. So it's a, it's a really a hard battle of man against nature. And uh, if you're interested in the things that can go wrong and how they can be solved, then uh, uh, Mark is a very good person to talk to. Um, uh, one of the fundamental limitations is the thermomechanical noise of the mechanical detector itself. So we are not in the regime uh, that, that Peter uh, in his uh, lecture at the beginning laid out uh, where the thermomechanical force noise is very small. In our case, it's actually the dominant source of, of noise for the detection. So we want to decrease it as much as possible. And the thermomechanical force noise has a power spectral density uh, that's given by temperature and then by this dissipation uh, number. So that's the mass of the resonator, its frequency and the quality factor. And a lot of work has gone into improving this here, especially. So uh, probably the most advanced of, of those examples is uh, using uh, a silicon nanowire for MRFM. That's uh, what uh, Rafi Budakin's lab is pioneering. Um, so you get a resonator that is much smaller, like Martino explained, has much smaller mass. Um, and therefore is intrinsically much more sensitive to forces. But the price you pay is that you work at different frequency and, and have a different configuration. So I, I understand it's, it's not easy to change everything to go with nanowire, but, but uh, Rafi's lab is really there now. And I think we're gonna hear much more about that just afterwards. <coughs> An even more extreme example is what, what we heard from Adrian Bachtold. So in Barcelona, they try to use a single carbon nanotube. You can just see it here uh, as a force detector. These are the the lightest and most sensitive clamped resonators that we can uh, make at the moment, as far as I understand. And again, the trouble is, you know, now you have a tremendously sensitive resonator, but on the other hand, you have to change the entire machinery around to, to, uh, to make MRFM work. And this is really a hard battle, and it's a very Im impressive uh, effort. <coughs> And then you can also do the opposite. So it's now uh, very counterintuitively uh, intuitively that people also try, uh, like Chris Hamill's lab, to do MRFM with a very massive object. So these silicon nitride membranes, they are much larger. You can really see them by eye. Um, and the, the, the fun fact there is that you, you also gain, not only if you decrease the mass here, they actually increase the mass, but they gain because they have very, very high quality factors. And we heard this also in the talk of of David Mason yesterday, uh, that people nowadays can make such membranes with extremely high quality factors. And this is something actually that we want to, to follow uh, uh, Chris Hamel's lab. And I'm coming back to that later in my talk. So in MRFM, uh, one of the most Im important components is the magnetic field gradient. And we tried for a long time to improve our little na nanomagnets that we evaporate. And there was uh, some sort of barrier between one and five megatesla per meter that, that we couldn't uh, overcome. And, and, and at some point we realized that the strongest field gradients, that probably the strongest nanoscale field gradients that mankind has produced so far are in commercial hard disks. 
So uh, I'm going to tell you now a little bit how we used such a, a write head from a hard disk in our scanning uh, probe experiment and uh, how that gave us immediately a sensitivity of about uh, 20 protons or 20 nuclear spins. <coughs> in principle, it's easy. You buy a hard disk. There are these boxes. They have typically, if you have a har uh, eight terabyte hard disk, you have four disks inside, and then for every disk you get two of these arms. And this here is the write head. Somewhere on this is a little element that writes the magnetic bits. So this is about a millimeter in size. You can grab it with a sharp tweezer and rip it off. Be sure, be sure to use an anti-magnetic tweezer because otherwise it just dangles afterwards on the tweezer tip. Um, and then you put it under the SEM. So you see here, I have to explain the geometry. These are the, the, the contacts, the electrical contacts that were here, the gold things. This surface is now this surface. So this is the surface that is in real operation very close to the magnetic disk, about three nanometers apart. It's really amazing. This is like alien technology to, to us uh, people who have only research clean rooms. And then you zoom in on this part right at the edge and you get this structure. And at this point, we needed a little help from somebody within Seagate who gave us a tip. He said, the right head is right here. So we zoom in on that. Now we see frontally on onto the surface and we see this structure. You don't see it by AFM, by the way. It's really super, super flat. It's covered by diamond-like coating. But in a SEM, you get this depth perception. And you see here, this is the right pole. This is about 100 nanometers large. That's where the field emerges from the surface. Som somewhere inside is a coil that magnetizes this right pole. Then it comes out of the surface. It magnetizes the, the, the disk, so it enters into the disk. And then it curves back into the surface at this yellow return shield. So that's also magnetic, but it's a very soft magnetic material. And in between here, there's a trailing gap that's non-magnetic. And you see that's about the 20 nanometers in size. And here, field lines curve out and curve right in. So you expect a very strong field gradient there. You have something that generates a large field to overcome the thermal uh, re resistance of the, of the magnetic ma material of the disk, and it curves within 20 nanometers. So this must be a large gradient. So we managed, there was uh, quite some work, we managed to, to mount them on our scanning force microscopy uh, a sample holder and, and connect the coil again uh, in a very rudimentary way. So I'm sure it could be done much better. But it worked and, and we could operate the right head again with, a, with a, a, a current source. And then what we did is we, we used the diamond tip and we evaporated a little bit, little bit of platinum, platinum onto the diamond tip. Platinum is a, is a, a paramagnet, so uh, inside this field, it got polarized this tiny bit, and, and then this polarized tip experienced the tiny force within the field gradient, the right head. And then by switching at half the resonance frequency of the cantilever, you generate a Fourier component at the of, of force at the frequency of the cantilever. So we simply by switching back and forth the right head magnetization, we could drive motion of the, the cantilever. And this is a force map. Uh, so you see here at dashed lines, you see the outline of the structure itself. Uh, bright means large force. So we measured a large, comparatively large uh, vibrational motion. And dark means very little motion. So you get these two lobes. And the strongest, actually, uh, signal here exactly at the trailing gap. And then uh, we didn't have a real reference for this. This is with a resolution of about 10 nanometers. I'm not aware that anybody else did that before. So in order to be sure that this is correct, we, we modeled uh, this in, in COMSOL to see what, what kind of field shape you expect. And this is the simulated uh, signal that we would get. So it's exactly the same two lobes and it looks very similar. <coughs> and from this, then we could calibrate what kind of field and field gradient we get. So you, here you have a, a very, very small element that makes a, a magnetic field almost of one Tesla right at the surface and a gradient of about 28 megatesla per meter. So it's five to six times larger than anything you can make with these uh, nanomagnets. And at the same time, it's not static. You can operate it almost as fast as you want. So in your uh, computer, it's operated, I think, at about a gigahertz uh, frequency. So it's a really amazing piece of technology if you can use that for something. Um, so this is published in this paper, and, and then almost at the same time, the Wachtwolf group 
also used right heads, it was mentioned uh, before, uh, together with NV centers, and they demonstrated that you can actually use this AC operation to do uh, um, uh, NMR pulses on, on uh, NV springs. Um, so this is nice, now we have a very strong field gradient, and the second component that is very crucial is of course the, the mechanical detector. This is one of the standard cantilevers that we use. I mentioned it's from made from silicon. It's about 100 micrometers long, has a resonance frequency of about 3 to 5 kilohertz. And we, we sort of like these large cantilevers because uh, they make it comparatively easy to mount a sample on. So if you want an influenza virus uh, at the tip, then it's much easier with such an object than if we have a nanowire or even a carbon nanotube. But we would still like to, to reduce the mass. So then uh, it was also Ye, I think, who had the, the very brilliant idea to reduce the mass simply by, by etching. So it, it takes a bit of creativity, but it also takes balls that to think that you can do something with your uh, EBL. Um, but it actually worked out, and I'm going to walk you quickly through it. The result is that we now have a, a, a cantilever that has a force sensitivity of below 200 zeppelin per square root of hertz. So it has a very, very low uh, force sensitivity. It's not at the level of a carbon nanotube or a levitated nanoparticle, but it's uh, a clamped, uh, top-down fabricated structure that's comparatively large and, and easy to mount samples on. This value is, is at the lowest, uh, is at Dilfridge temperature. So it's, it's about, the I think the sample temperature was maybe 100 millikelvin or something like that. Is that right, Martin? So this is a photograph of, of, uh, of such a nanoladder cantilever. So here is the substrate where it's clamped. You see here the individual rungs. These uh, lines are about 200 nanometers thick. So you need to be really good with your etching calibration. Um, and in this example, it's still tethered to the other side to protect it against uh, collapse during the fabrication. In the last step of fabrication, uh, this, this tether was cut, for instance, by helium fib. And so this is straightforward, the trick that you reduce the mass in order to get a lower force sensitivity. The quality factor of these devices is on the same order as, as the, the, the full slabs. It's maybe slightly lower because you have a relatively higher surface than, than if you have a standard cantilever. Um, the resonance frequency is about the same because in principle you have now two nanowires. So imagine you have parallel nanowires. They, they all have the same frequency, no, no matter whether you have one or ten. And we could make them from silicon and from diamond, so, so the trick works with uh, several materials apparently, and they both turned out to have almost the same force sensitivity. And just to compare, so this in principle, if you compare this with a, with a, a hard drive field gradient, in principle this would allow you to uh, uh, detect a single proton within a second, or within a one hertz bandwidth, which is not quite the same. Now, of course, uh, it's not the same to, to, to juggle these uh, numbers and to do it, but, but uh, it's encouraging that, that at least uh, as a prospect, uh, it, it seems that there is a way to do such things. And there was a poster by Martin, so Martin spent a lot of time calibrating this. This, this is now uh, his work, I would say. Now I'll switch a bit and, and tell you about something new that, that we are trying, and this is a collaboration with the group of Albert Schließer and, and David Mason talked about these devices. This is the same uh, paper that he talked about. So uh, the Schließer group made a big step in not only improving the quality factors of these membranes, but especially to, to, to understand why they get high quality factors and, 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 and what are the crucial factors. So what I found impressive is that they, they can simulate uh, what quality factors they should get and, and it agrees really well with with the numbers, which is something that, you know, for a long time in nanomechanics, you, you might have a good or a bad quality factor, but it was very hard to understand why. And, and here uh, there's a very convincing argument that, that it's quite well under control. The idea is here to use the membrane as a force detector. So it's not this thing here that vibrates and that, that you read out as a, as a force detector, it's the membrane. This here is just uh, inertial, uh, tip that you scan over the surface to uh, make a, a field, a magnetic field gradient. So this could be a MFM tip, a commercial one. This here is your force sensor. So this plays the role of the cantilever. 
and your sample is sitting on the membrane, which is much easier than if you have to put it on the tip of a cantilever. Um, and, and you still need, uh, of course, uh, NMR pulses, so we are I envisaging, uh, uh, we're hoping that we will manage to, uh, to have a, a second chip just underneath the, the membrane to apply pulses, maybe even for capacitive readout of the motion of the, of the membrane. Um, so these membranes have a, a very similar force sensitivity as the cantilevers, but they have a high mass, they have a very high spring constant, they win because they have very high quality factor. So it's sort of the, the, the other side of the story. Now, the nanoladder cantilevers, we, re we reduce the force, uh, the spring constant as much as possible. Here, we don't care so much about the spring constant. It might actually be nice to have a high spring constant because uh, s snapping contact is, is much reduced. We hope that non-contact friction might be reduced because this is a relatively large object uh, and still you get a large, uh, a good force sensitivity. So we think that this is a new force sensing paradigm, if, if I may use this big word, and, and, and that it will still allow us to get to sub newton sensitivity and, and sub-nanometer uh, resolution. Uh, and first steps that we are taking is that, that David Held uh, put together a, a simple uh, AFM, uh, just like in this picture. So this is a commercial AFM cantilever, and he can approach the membrane, and he's testing right now uh, what that does to the membrane if you if you get the tip close to the surface. So at what point the quality factor drops and by how much and so on. And here in the back, so here you see one of these membranes. This is the pattern of the membrane. In the middle, I, I think you don't cannot see it here. This is like this is the size of the defect. And in the background, you can see the lens that focuses the laser onto the membrane. So we also have to grow some legs in this field. Uh, we had to learn a lot about how to operate them. We have to improve our interferometer a lot if we want to do these things. And we're working on that also with the help of the Schließer group. Uh, so we have a collaboration on this. And, uh, but you can see that already after trying a few membranes, we found one mode that has a 100 million quality factor at the room temperature. So these numbers are not uh, something extreme. You, you try a few, you actually find these modes. This is really reproducible. And we also start to, to characterize the, the, the frequency power speckle density. This is something that in the past we had not done. Now we are really interested to, 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 to measure these things. So this is new land for us and it's very exciting. And as I said, in many things we will be limited by the interferometer noise. Um, so if we can measure better, we, we can apply feedback or f force techniques or, or uh, um, of the mechanics tricks. So maybe we will have to at some point make this into a cavity geometry. And one thing, uh, last thing that, that I find very interesting about these membranes is that it's much easier to apply parametric techniques. So what I mean by parametric is that imagine you have a string, you hold it like that. If you do this at the resonance frequency, you drive it directly. But if you move your hands like that, like in this, in these arrows here indicate, what you do is you change the tension along the string and that makes a, that's what we call a parametric modulation. So for instance, if the string goes up and you, you, you relax it, it will go to large amplitude. And then every time it goes through zero, you pull, you accelerate it. So you amplify this motion. So this is a very simple sketch for how, why intuitively parametric amplification works. And parametric physics is used in many uh, parts of physics. So nonlinear optics uses it since decades for many, many things uh, with great success. And you can see here signal amplification, noise squeezing, mode coupling, uh, Rabi oscillations and optomechanics is basically a parametric effect and so on. Uh, the best quantum electronics amplifiers are based on, on, on parametric amplification. Uh, and nanomechanics has really caught on in the last 10, 20 years. And, and again, uh, uh, the foundational paper is one of, of them. Um, so in, in our membrane project, uh, I see several ways how you can use parametric physics to to make uh, a sensitive uh, detection possible. One is that if you invert the spin periodically, you not only generate a force, you only generate a change in the spring constant of your membrane. So the second derivation of the magnetic energy is a spring constant. And you can use this to couple different modes. So if you in invert the nuclear spin at a frequency omega p for parametric, you make a parametric pulse that couples two modes. It's, it's a bit similar to, to a Rabi oscillation where you couple two to uh, uh, level states. Of course, these are not uh, two levels, but these would now be two uh, bosonic uh, modes. 
but still you can transfer energy from one to the other. And here the trick that is uh, discussed in this old paper already, and I think uh, uh, John Maron uh, used this with uh, electron spin detection, is that you drive one mode very hard externally, so you apply as much drive as you can, and then you couple the two modes and some of the energy is transferred to the other mode and you observe the increase of amplitude. So the, uh, this technique uh, can be advantageous in some cases because you can amplify your signal as, as long as you can drive harder on, on this frequency. And then there's a very different technique that is based on uh, something that we studied very recently. I'm not going into details here, but for the specialists, uh, what you see here is, is, a, is a, a mechanical mode that is driven at the same time by a parametric drive and by an external drive. And the interaction of these two drives uh, makes that the parametric phase states are, are split. So the, the symmetry between these parametric phase states is broken. And as a direct uh, result of this parametric symmetry breaking, you get in one direction, you still get this duffing like jump. In the other direction, you get st still this jump that you expect, but then you get a second jump. So you get a double hysteresis uh, as, a, as a direct manifestation of this interaction between the two drives. And what's fun uh, is we realize that the frequency at which this jump occurs is indicative of the amplitude of the force that you apply. So you can use the frequency here as a force detector. And in some cases, we, we, we realize that this can be more sensitive than direct amplitude detection. So with this, I'm done. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the group of, of Christian uh, and also our collaborators. So for the things that I told you, our collaborators are Orit Silberberg and, and uh, R. Chitra. These are PIs at, uh, in the theory department at ETH. And uh, I had the pleasure of working together a lot with them. And it's, it's really very stimulating uh, and a lot of fun. To at ETH, it's really you have to cross the street to get to the theory department. So we say crossing the street is very important. So I learned a lot from them. And, and now we have this collaboration with uh, Albert Schlieser and his group, and this is uh, something that I find very exciting. And uh, the NanoLadder was still a collaboration with Ye Tao and Ying Pang Hong uh, from uh, Harvard. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. Point taken. <laughs> so what's the gradient that you get in these? Right. So, so here, essentially, it's the same that's done, right? You have, a, you have a magnetic material that is polarized like that, and the other is polarized like that. And the polarization that they get is really very high. So they have some, some iron cobalt um, with, with, I think they have a magnetization of 2.3 to 2.4 Tesla. So but it's, it's really... So it's important. It's important also to have depth. But but uh, thanks for the comment. Yes. 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 Not yet. I thought. I hope in a few weeks we have some some good data. But um, so I. Naively, I, I, I would hope that since only a very small part of the membrane is affected by the contact, because your contact is much, much, much smaller than your membrane, it's about 300 micrometers, that, that the, the non-contact friction might be affecting the, the thing much less. It's, it's a naive approach maybe, but let's see whether I'm right or not. Thank you.
this here. <clears throat> I, I, I mean, uh, th that would be great. I think uh, you, if you try to fib it out, it's, it's probably really hard because you also have to fib out the, the coil. And I think that's much, much larger. Um, if you want to do the entire thing, it's about a, uh, a millimeter large. So you, I mean, if you if you can spare that that space, then 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 yes. But I think Seagate could do it if they wanted, right? But of course, they have <laughs> no intention of making customized samples for us. I mean, that's what they do with the arm, right? In, a, in real operation, they are scanned a few nanometers over a surface. So they're done for that, but, but your surface has to also be very flat. So. I think that was a diamond lever. Can you, Ye, can you, can you confirm that? Yeah, diamond. So so yeah, I mean, I mean we don't cut here. We cut we, we cut somewhere here. Ah here, ah. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay, okay. Next time we cut one, we we can keep it. Yeah. <laughs> so much effort for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We sell it. We make a company. We sell it. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs>